my name is Yuri Matsarsky. For more than 20 years, I've been a journalist. I've been a journalist in really, really different situations, in really different places. I worked as a journalist, as a reporter in the United States, in United Kingdom, but mostly I was working as a journalist in a really bad places. So, for example, I was uh, covering the situation uh, close to Fukushima a nuclear station in Japan right after the blast there. And uh, I worked as a journalist uh, in a whole bunch of wars in the Middle East, starting from Gaza Strip and ending with Iraq and Syria. So only a month ago, less than a month ago, I was a journalist. I was a guy who, you know, who had... Uh, I have my own radio show, daily radio show, I have TV presence. I wrote a few articles every week for different Ukrainian and not only Ukrainian news sites. Now, you know, for almost a month, I'm just a soldier. I have my assault rifle. I have my bulletproof vest. The only, you know, I have some kind of uh, the, the link which is, uh, you know, uh, which is tying me to in my new profession with my old profession this is my helmet because i was a war journalist because i uh, i spent a lot of time in the wars of course i have uh, i have had a helmet with, with huge uh with huge uh, uh black helmet with a white words white letters press on it but uh, on the first day of war i took uh, uh, the marker the black my marker of my daughter and painted Black, all these huge white letters press. So that's how my uh, my journalist helmet, my press helmet became my war helmet. It's with me also. You know, I was, as uh, millions of other people, I discovered that the war started just because, uh, you know, rockets were firing right uh right uh, behind the roof of my house so i was w w waking up at about five o'clock because uh, uh, i think it was you know it was the sound of uh, ukrainian anti-rockets which intercepted the russian rockets um, which are targeting uh, which, which are targeting kiev and surroundings of the kiev so i looked at the window and i saw that you know all the skies we were in some kind of, of, it was like lightnings, you know? It was a lot of lightnings all around, and it was the sound of a bombardment. I, I really know the sound of bombardment really good because, you know, I was a journalist. So my first thought was about my family. My first thought was about my daughter. And I, and I, and I thought to myself, oh, that's great that she's not in Ukraine now because she left uh, Ukraine for vacations just four or five days before before the invasion started. And after that, I thought about my parents who lived at that time much closer uh, to Russian border than me because uh, our family, the roots of our family is in Kharkiv. Is in Kharkiv. Kharkiv is only about four kilometers away from border with Russia. So my my first my thoughts were with my parents who were there and uh, I called them and they said, oh, it's okay with, uh, with us. Of course, we are hearing blasts. Of course, we are see everything which is uh, going around us. But that's okay. That's okay. We will stay here. We will uh, we will stay in Kharkiv uh, until uh, everything is completed. But uh, we could not stay uh, in uh, in Kharkiv for long uh, because few rockets uh, got into into the house. It's a multi-story house, uh, and uh, uh, there were no electricity, no water, no heating in the flat for uh, uh, more than a week. We, we lived, you know, just in some kind of almost, you know, cave era, cave ages uh, uh, situation. No, no, no electricity, no water, no anything, no gas inside. So no any, uh, you couldn't prepare the food and you couldn't go away for uh, to buy this food because everything is closed. And uh, even if something is open, it's, it's, you know, it was dangerous to go out because every few minutes, every few minutes, 
a uh, rocket or bomb were falling on on the, on the ground on the streets on the on the buildings uh, one of the friends of mine he counted that uh, russians for the, for just two first week of the war destroyed more buildings in kharkiv than nazis during the whole second world war you see they destroyed more buildings for two weeks than nazis in the same kharkiv destroyed for a whole second world war so you should understand anything and anyone should understand it but targeting not military installation we're targeting not the, some, some kind of military bases or something like this no we're targeting civilian districts we're targeting houses we're targeting hospitals including maternity hospitals the school to which my daughter uh in which my daughter uh, learn for a while in Kharkiv. In this school, few grad rockets came. You, you see, it, it's destroyed. There is no school at all. Uh, as, I, as I read, uh, there are more than 50 schools in Kharkiv destroyed. It's only in only one city. In only one city. 50 schools destroyed by bombs and rockets. So these, these people who are doing this, I don't know, I, I can't call people can't call them people at all. No, people don't do things like that. Nazis do things like that. ISIS do things like that. Russians do things, things like that. You see all these words about we are fighting to free Ukrainians from Nazis. We are fighting to free Ukrainians from some kind of inner Ukrainian enemies. It's you know it's not for us. It's not for me. And it's not for you. It's not for people in a free world. It's only for the people inside Russia. They don't have, uh, for uh, you know, uh, the Russian government, step by step, for decades, we are building this huge propaganda machine, destroying one by one um, independent uh, uh, medias or uh, forcing people who are, you know, representing these medias to flee the country or murdering them. Yeah. You know, there are a lot of... Uh, a lot of cases of murdering journalists or politicians who, are, who was not agree you know, with uh, with Putin and his government. So they ended up a uh, uh, few years ago with uh, you know with completely different situation informational situation inside the country. It was you know it was just like in during Nazi era in in Germany. We don't have any access to even to some kind of German language. Uh, uh, newspapers or radio stations from uh, neighboring Switzerland. No, we don't have access to it. We hope we have only way own Folkische Beobachter or uh, Der Sturmer or something like this. And it was um, uh, it was you know the main uh, the main goal of uh, building such of uh, uh, of uh, um, of, propag of a propagandist media is to shield the truth, is to make some kind of you know. Of smoke shield, of smoke screen, uh, for for the truth. For for, for uh, if you know, uh, if people in Russia, if someone will say to them, no, you know, it's not true. You are killing civilians. You are bombing. Uh, you are bombing hospitals. You are killing kids. You are killing pregnant women. They say, oh no, it's fake news because we we have our our medias. Uh, it's you know, it was step by step. It was work which was made step by step, year by year day by day to to build such you know monstrous uh propag propagandist machine uh it, and it, it wasn't built for us as i told you it was built for them they are you know they're just like blindfolded they don't want to hear the truth they don't want to know that we are criminals they don't want to want to know that their country is a country of murderers of robbers and rapists but this is the truth we are a country of murderers of robbers and the country of rapists. That's the, that's the only truth. There is no other truth. There is no, you know, some kind of alternative truth. There is only one truth. And this truth, it's not so easy to to uh, to accept uh, for Russians. But of course, uh, someday we, we will need to accept it. I'm so sorry for talking again about Second World War. I'm so sorry about talking again, to, uh, again about Nazis, allies, and so all our things from 30s and 40s from previous century. But uh, let's see what's going on in Europe uh, 
when uh, Hitler uh, were preparing to invade and to occupy Czechoslovakia. All the free world was telling, okay, it would be enough for him. Okay, let's give Czechoslovakia to him, or it would be better for all of us. We don't want to fight for these Czech people. We don't even know who are they. We don't. We don't want to to war for to to fight for uh, some kind of Slovakian people. We don't even know who are they. Let's let's uh, give it to Hitler. Let's give it to Hitler, and maybe maybe uh, we will buy peace with uh, with such you know with with such an act. <coughs> but you can't. You cannot buy a peace if you have. To deal with a maniac, you can't buy a peace, giving him something or someone, and hoping that it would be it would be enough for him. No, you can't buy a peace. You can buy only time, but sooner or later, in any case, you will face him. You will face this maniac. You will face his rockets. You will face his tanks, and so on and so on. So I think it's my my opinion. I think it's better to Europe, it's better to United States, it's better to NATO and European Union to stand right now with Ukraine while we are fighting. Because when there are a lot of us, we we are, you know, much stronger. And uh, uh, it is much more difficult to any enemy to, to defeat us. So in my opinion, in my opinion, it's time, you know, for Western civilization to take part in this war. It's not, <coughs> first of all, that's because it's not only a war against Ukraine, you know? It's a war against democracy. It's a war against, uh, against uh, independence. It's a war against freedom, first of all. We, we think that uh, Putin and the Russian elite <coughs> hates most it's freedom. They, they hate freedom. They don't even uh, like to hear this word. So uh, he, I think, I think he is preparing some kind of uh, bad things for Western countries too. I think he's preparing some kind of uh, terroristic, barbaric uh, act against uh, European countries. And uh, it's it's not in use for us because he already made such things. You can um, remember Salisbury uh, in the in the United Kingdom. You can remember blasts in the uh, in some kind of uh, weapon storage warehouse, warehouse uh, uh, where were blasts, uh, which were also made by by Russians. There are a lot of bad things, really bad things, uh, which were, were done and still doing by Russian intelligence service, by Russian spies by Russian agents uh, in European countries and in Western countries in common. Uh, you know, right now I'm at the same time uh, a soldier, a fixer for journalists and a journalist. And it, it was not my choice. I, you know, I volunteered uh, to, to the army. I joined the territorial defense units uh, with only one goal to, to be a soldier. But you know, uh, it uh, in a few days after I joined, uh, my commander came to me, ran into me, with you know, with his eyes uh, uh, huge as I don't know what, and he was pale <coughs> from from a fear, and he was shouting at me, "What have you done? What have you done?" I, said, I don't know what have I done. <coughs> in the headquarters, the commanders from the headquarters, we want to see you right now. So let's go to the headquarters. So we went to the headquarters just to discover that one of the commanders in chief, he was my listener uh, in a, you know during the peace time. So he discovered that one of his in his platoons were two guys who were journalists. We have uh, volunteered me and my co-host, the guy with whom we made our show. We joined uh, the, uh, the army together, and we were in the same and we still in the same platoon. So uh, this uh, this commander he uh, he received a list with the names of uh, his soldiers and he saw our names and he said oh I know these guys we are journalists and I want them to be here so we came to headquarters and this guy this one of the commanders told us guys we have a lot of requests from uh, from foreign journalists who are coming to Kiev who are visiting uh, our positions and uh, I know that you were journalists. 
and I also know I know that you knew that you know the uh, foreign languages. So please, if you have time, and if you are ready to, please uh, guide these guys, these foreign journalists, uh, uh, on our positions. Beware fixers in here. Arrange interviews and uh, filming for them. Uh, so you know, I've spent during the time while we are riding with these foreign journalists, I making my uh, my short stories about what's going on, and even in the evening I record with with my uh, small. Uh, uh, recorder which was with me since since uh, uh, since the times of peace. So but this is but at the same time we also as I told you we also as soldiers we have assault rifles. I have about six kilos of ammo on me. <laughs> All my pockets are full of ammo. You know, so we are manning the checkpoints. We are doing the patrol in the streets. So we we have. Three different jobs right now uh, in the uh, in the Ukrainian army. I have a few words to tell to the Western world, and uh, someone uh, could find these words rude or even aggressive. But I think I should tell them. You know, guys, in this situation, in you know, is in this war which is unprovoked, which was you know. It's undeclared and which is so brutal against Ukraine. Anyone and everyone can be the hero and should be the hero in European countries without even taking arms, you know, in your hands. So you have two very, very easy choices how to be a hero, how to save human lives, how to save Ukrainian lives, how to save freedom, how to save democracy. First thing is to help the refugees who are still coming to European countries. You know, it's such a big deal because I'm also, you know, I'm the father of a refugee and I'm also a son of the refugees because my daughter is a refugee and my parents are the refugees in different countries now. And I can tell you, you know, as a as a as a guy whose relatives are now refugees. Please help our people who are coming to, to Europe. It's such a big deal. You can spend a couple of dollars or you can, or you, can you know, buy a piece of chocolate, a piece of bread for a, for a Ukrainian girl or boy. But please do it. It's, you know, it's for your own sake. It's not for only our sake. This is the first and this is the easiest thing to do. The second thing, I think it's it takes little little more courage, but of course it's also uh, this is really really thing that need need to be done. Please, if you have some kind of free time, if you have some kind of courage in you, take the streets of your cities, of your towns, of your uh, of your villages even. Take streets, take uh, squares, and demand from your governments, demand from your statesmen. The more military help, the more military aid for Ukraine. First of all, we need anti-rocket systems, anti-missile systems, and we need more planes to protect our towns and our cities. We will not use these planes, or we will not, we will not use these uh, uh, rockets to, to, you know, to target Russian cities. No, we will use it only to protect our own civilians. We will use it only to protect kids, women, elderly person. And you can do it right now. You can save lives of the innocent people, including the small children right now. And I can't even, rem I can't imagine how people, you know, going to sleep every night or going to some kind of dates with one with another or going to work knowing that we can save Ukrainian children but not doing it. It's impossible. I can't imagine that someone will tell me, uh, you know, you, you, can, you can save lives of people in our country just, uh, just going to the street with some kind of, you know, of a sign in your hands and uh, to demand it from, from your government. 
Of course, I in this situation, I left all the other businesses behind and I ran to the street. And for for me, it's impossible to, to know that a lot of people all around the world knowing what we can save life of Ukrainians, knowing what we can save kids' lives, women's lives, don't do it. It's 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 impossible for me. <laughs>